photograph. <laughs> um, I want to show you how to uh, draw the sphere. And it's a lot easier if you have um, a photo of the sphere in front of you. So what I did was I gessoed a small handball and then uh, put it on a gray background and photographed it. And I enhanced it a little bit with Photoshop to give you a sense or an idea of the highlights, middle tone, and background. So you might want to have this out on the desk and you can print it out. Um, and I'm using, instead of pencils, these things which are called lithograph crayons. And lithograph crayons are basically, they're waxy but they're archival and they don't smudge and you can get a really dark black with it. So I think for the sake of uh, the videos, it's easier for me to draw with this. The only problem is, is that I can't erase. Um, and I really think erasing is an important <laughs> part of drawing. So I call this the much needed eraser. Um, but you know, it's kind of funny. If you're drawing in pencil, uh, feel free to erase. Also stop the video and, and fix things up. Now, the main idea be about drawing spheres is that basic geometric forms underlay everything that you're going to be drawing from here on out if you become an artist. And so you basically should be able to draw a sphere freehand. Um, it's hard, you know. And so what some people do is, you know, some drawing instructors tell you to do is to just loosen up. See, they're not perfect, but what I'm doing is I'm doing like this sort of light um, sketchy thing. And I'm. this is a, I guess it's called Total Art Products Universal Lead Holder. It has a piece of litho crayon in it, and um, you can take the crayon in and out, and um, so I don't have to sharpen as much. Uh, but probably a good exercise would be to um, just do a whole page of spheres freehand. And the other thing that I, I'm hoping you're kind of seeing this in the video, uh, it's pretty light. Um, I'll take a picture of it so that there's a better shot. You can see how light they are. They are basically imperfect, but I could, I could fix them later. Uh, I can't find my compass, which is that uh, drawing thing that people use to, to make a sphere. You can use that as well. But it's probably better to learn how to draw some things freehand like this so that you can, you know, sort of work with them and, and start uh, fixing them up. And if you look at this sphere, um, it has a whole bunch of components to it that I think you need to learn about. And so basically... Um, I have a video on chiaroscuro, but I'm also going to point it out now. Um, right here is where the highlight is. And as you move away from the highlight in a sort of concentric circle, you get this variation of tone or shading that goes up to um, a core shadow. So all of this is middle tones. This is the core shadow, and it's actually almost as dark usually as the cast shadow underneath it. And as you move away from the core shadow and keep going, you'll see that the shading changes a little and, and, and varies. And part of that is because um, there's light bouncing off of the table, and that's called ambient light, and then you have that cast shadow. So I guess having drawn this entire um, sketchbook full of spheres, I think it might be a good idea for me to draw a little bit for you um, how I would shade these in different techniques I guess might be kind of a cool thing to do. I hope I don't bump my tripod here. I just wanted to get a little closer to the camera. Alright, so you know you can put the the, um, the tabletop wherever you like and I'm using this pencil and I'm just sort of like going back over to try to get, a, get it laid out a little bit better than it was. Now, if the light is coming from this direction, um, the shape that a sphere makes um, when it's casting a shadow, this here, is called an ellipse. Okay, And so an ellipse is the cast shadow. And so what I'm starting to do is a, a technique that I call mapping or laying out. 
mapping or laying out just allows you to kind of get a sense of where things are supposed to go and, and block things in. So I'm going to indicate in really lightly um, the core shadow. I can't indicate in the highlight because once you do that, it sort of creates a, a circle around and looks bad. Um, I'm just using, this is basically just like a pencil, but notice that I'm kind of holding it like this uh, rather than holding it like this. Try that, you know, and hold it my way. Look at your hand and hold the pencil like this. Ooh, look how dirty my fingernails are. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so if you hold it like this, it's easier to just let the weight of the um, pencil just lay on the paper and you can start building up a little bit of shading or a little bit of value. And I'm kind of going, oh, this is almost a technique called cross hatching where I'm just sort of zigging and zagging like that. And so if I just lay my um, pencil down, just the, the, the end of it, the tip of it, but not the point of it, okay? And I start developing, almost like a photograph develops. So, you know, my fantasy when I was doing this was I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool if people drew while I was drawing and I could go back over the things. One of the things I don't like about the photo that I gave you is where the, um, the shadow falls here. Pay attention to that. This shape here is called an ellipse. And I guess the best way to show you an ellipse, especially on camera, is this is a sphere. You could even use it to draw one of your spheres, right? Make sure it's perfect, whatever. Okay. But um, when you're looking at a sphere or a circle that's coming towards you this way, and it turns this way, do you see how this shape is like the shadow on the page? That's called an ellipse. There's actually a couple of different ways to draw ellipses. Um, one technique is to start with an absolutely horizontal line that's parallel to the top and the bottom of the picture plane. And then you put a sort of C-clamp on either end of that. And realize that the ellipse is going to bow between those things. Right? And what you have then is a horizontal line. And you could even check the ellipse. I'm going to check the ellipse I drew. Um, yeah, it's about accurate. It's kind of funny, in this one, the light source, I think, is slightly in front, so, the, so it actually goes up slightly. All right, so this is laid down, and now what I'm doing is I'm shading after the core shadow, and I'm shading the cast shadow, and I'm coming back up here, and I'm shading where the tabletop meets the edge of the sphere. I'm going to work my way around it. And what I'm hoping is, as I do this, my eye will become a little bit more accurate and I can fix the sphere that I've been drawing. All right. Um, so, you want to match the value, which is the shading, of what each component has. Depending on how good your, your uh, laser jet printer or inkjet printer is, you can set it to photo mode and probably get a lot of grays in this. I'd actually even think about keeping it in color, but basically what I'm doing is I'm adding a little bit of light tone all the way around where I think that highlight should be. The, I'm going to fix up the cast shadow.
it's a slow process and it's almost like building up a um if you've ever been in a dark room it's a little bit like that where you're watching the picture develop out of nothing and one of the things that i'm hoping that will happen is that I will develop the correct value structure and I'll be able to match what I see in that photograph. Remember that photograph is enhanced and there's a reason why I keep bringing that up is um, what I'm doing is I'm giving you an ideal view of a sphere and what I'm hoping to do is I'll also give you some other photographs of different kinds of spheres different lit in different ways and as you learn how to draw those things and shade those things, what can happen for you is you'll get to see the differences um, in terms of shading, and you'll also learn how to control the drawing material and the shading. So it's a little bit of two things. It seems like the easiest part was actually laying in um, the, uh, the shapes, but it wasn't. Remember, I had to draw a whole page of those. So Think about the fact that I've drawn probably thousands of pages of spheres, especially since I'm a teacher, it's probably made me a little bit better at drawing spheres, cones, and cubes than, than uh, some uh, people who are in the same class of artists as me. <laughs> um, because I've actually taken, because I teach drawing, I have to practice what I preach, and I have to think about it all the time. So I'm always thinking about looking for, for the highlight, middle tones, core shadow. And the other thing that I'm trying to do in this is make it look like a photograph, right? So the idea then is there are really, whoops, <laughs> no line. That's going to kind of bother me later. Um, also, look, the height of the tabletop that I put in is different. Um, what I'm trying to do is match the value structure and the shading as much as possible so that the edges of the shape are defined by shade, not by a line. So all the lines that I drew initially, save maybe one or two, are kind of disappearing because they were drawn in the lightest possible value that, that I'll be drawing in. And so as I develop this drawing more and more, and this is something that you should, you should probably draw 10 to 15 spheres on your own. Um, <laughs> no kidding. Do it while you're in class, well, you know, if you're bored in a lecture, but not in my class. <laughs> that was my dog, Chuck. All right, so I've got some value structure going on now. I can develop it further. Sometimes I even start with, uh, with this kind of drawing material that I have here. These are just basically chunks of that waxy crayon stuff. And um, what I want to show you is, do you see how the tip of it is uh, sort of rounded off and there are edges and things? I actually got, I know these edges and stuff. And I can use them almost like how you'd use a scraper or a, um, if you use some kind of electric shaver. And so what I'm going to be able to do is I'm using the edge of it to sort of scrub in some of the darkness. Now the graphite stuff that I assign my students to, which is just basically what's in a lead pencil but in solid chunks, is basically the same thing. The thing that I like about this is it barely smears. If you do that with a graphite drawing, it's going to be smeared all over the place. Um, So what I'm doing is I'm using this stuff almost like a mist from a spray gun. And I'm darkening areas. And I'm trying to match the shading that I see in the photograph that I printed out. Because one of the things that I'm hoping you'll kind of learn how to do is, um, is to match Shading match value. Value structure is basically shading. Another word for that could be uh, chiaroscuro. Okay. Now I've got this sort of ghosted shape in here now, and it's got it's it's I think it's uh, got a lot of good value structure. There's I, I can see that I've got the core in there pretty accurate. The background needs to go darker. 
the tabletop could go probably even a little darker. Um, and so what I need to do then is, I remember this artist once saying, and I don't know if, if every artist would agree with this, but she said something like, the, the last things that go in are usually the first things that you see and want to put in. And what I'm specifically talking about is the, um, the darks and the lights. Now, in drawing, the, the lights are the, the paper, right? So, but in, uh, in drawing, you actually, actually have to leave the paper lighter. So it's almost like I advocate for working uh, a little bit more gently. This is a litho crayon. You can actually just tear the, the thing down and get a tip on it. This is probably a little too long. It might break while I'm drawing, but um, this kind of litho crayon is a little darker than the other grade. Yeah, this tip is so long I have to break it so that I have a sturdier tip. Okay. Now, one of the other things that, you know, I used to assign, but students don't seem to have the patience for it is to draw a value scale in my classes so that they learn how to control the drawing material and do some things. And we would, we would do value scales um, where we do it in different materials and we do it with different uh, techniques like cross hatching and, uh, and smearing and stuff like that and sometimes wash. Um, but if you were a really good student and you were studying at a school where you were paying a lot of money and you'd do whatever they said, <laughs> um, you would do basically value scales. You just draw two or three of these and you try to try to work it out. These exercises that, that I'm starting with, these basic shapes, it's kind of like the Vince Lombardi coaching kind of thing that it's uh, it's like stepping up and getting into the batting cage or if you're playing basketball and learning how to uh, to sink a, a basket, you have to do it thousands of times before you can do it under pressure. And so if you were to practice this a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of times and you get it right and you check your shapes and so on and so forth, then what would happen when you got to a still life or when you were drawing um, a person is that your drawing would be more accurate um, because you had done it in rehearsal. And all those cliches about practicing well, just become an art teacher and then you have to do it all the time. It's not a perfect sphere. It's pretty good. Let's see, darken it up even more. They sell this stuff, this uh, lith lithography crayon stuff, in uh, all kinds of different shapes and sizes and sticks, and sometimes it's easier to, to trade off rather than just trying to use one pencil um, all the time with the different materials. I'm hoping that the camera will catch a lot of the... Uh, value structure, but I'm a little worried that it won't. And so I'm going to try to overstate it slightly so that you can really see where the core is and then where the, the reflected light is and also see how the edges of the object are, play, are shaped by contrasts of shading rather than by contrasts of um, line than by putting in a, a hard line. Sometimes you get things called soft edges too, which are where something, a shape will dissolve into the background. And that just provides sort of visual interest.
All right. Well, now we've done one with crayon and litho. I want to show you a slightly different technique. Um, and just combine them all into one lesson because I think that sometimes people don't learn all the different ways that they should. So let me, I'll just do it on this page and I'll do it slightly larger. I'm going to draw myself another sphere. And this time I'll make it a little bit more close to the accuracy of uh, one of the things that you may want to do is that the larger you draw, the uh, the easier it is actually in some ways to draw. Now what I'm going to use primarily is a bunch of marks to create the um, the illusion of space. So one of the things is overlapping marks to create an um, dark value. This is called a hatch, and this is called a crosshatch. So if I was to create a series of hatch marks that create a sort of pattern along the back edge of that sphere, and then I th was to think about it, and oh, well, I'm going to do the same thing with the cast shadow. That's almost the same value, but this time I'm going to use horizontal hatch marks. See how the horizontal hatch marks kind of pull the shadow horizontally? And so maybe I'll go into the core shadow and use diagonal hatch marks. And what you can do is you can keep overlapping and overlapping and overlapping. And you should do this 15 or 20 times, make drawings like this, so that you start building up an approximate value structure, but this time with just lines. And um, for instance, you could just even use something like this and go with really fine lines. You keep layering them up 